I got a new prescription right before the Oscars. And my stylist took two frames and bejeweled them for the look. Yes. When I got back, it was coronavirus. So the only glasses that I can see out of are the bejeweled ones. I yes. <laughs> love this. <laughs> oh my God. So I'm walking around with these bejeweled glasses, but they're the ones I can see the best out of. <laughs> Share one with us that like stands out for you or, or an experience um, that you really have taken away from Pose. To dream the impossible. Mm. I have always had big dreams. Always, always, always. Huge huge dreams and even inside of that because they were springboarded off of stuff i had already seen i was never dreaming something that i hadn't seen so for the first 20 plus years of my career 20 years i'll say consciously i was trying to fit in to a paradigm that I was told was the only way. And there was nothing reflected back at me that told me otherwise. You know, if you're not masculine enough by society standards, you will not work, you black faggot you. That's what I was told. That was the messaging and that was the truth for a very, very long time. And I'm not talking about working. I'm talking about, you know, cause I worked. I'm talking about what I'm doing right now. It's not often that the trailblazer, the one who kicks the door down, gets to walk through it and receive the glory from having the door been kicked open and down. I am grateful to have had the obstacles that I had because it made me go deeper. You know, yes, I had to fight. I had to fight my ass off. I still fight. But I am so rich because of it. You know, My soul is enriched, my spirit is enriched, and therefore I can give and I can share creatively. The first time you you were in a big competition, after you came out and what that felt like, you're like, okay, I don't care what you people think. I don't care if you think I'm too flamboyant or I'm not in the closet anymore. What was that like? Um, I realized that a lot of like the fears and the doubts were all things that I put in my own head. Um, because I, I refuse to believe any other sort of circumstance besides the one that I'm going to share with you. And the one thing that I told myself was that like, if I showed up prepared, if I showed up ready and if I showed up in shape and I, and I showed up and I skated really well, it, nothing, there would be nothing anybody could do to like deny me of a result that I had earned or deserved. Hmm. And, um, I also remember that I waited to come out to just be skating really well so that like I could be a really good role model for like my younger self. And I could just be like in that place of, of showing that it wasn't something that it was a distraction. I wasn't doing it to get attention. It was just something I really just needed to relieve myself of the pressure of holding on to. And I remember that, more so than the first competition I had done, um, but maybe the first nationals I had done as like an openly out athlete. And I just went in and I just felt very comfortable in my own skin and I felt really powerful Hmm. because I felt like I was truly putting everything I had out there and I wasn't holding anything back from anyone. Um, And it was the nationals that I won so it was just, it, it, it probably, it was like the culmination of everything coming together of me really embracing who I was. But in, in that, I became so much stronger than I ever was too. Since 2016, we have been on this downward spiral. And there's a part of me just that just feels like God or the universe or whatever you want to call it has said to us, like, go to your rooms. 
Go inside your houses, think about what you've done, and you will come out when you can treat each other like human beings again. But you don't get to be around each other if you're going to keep doing this. And that's the only thing I can think of that makes any sense to me. Or this is God's time out. It's beautiful. You know, and like we have an opportunity to turn this into a lesson and we can come out of it stronger, closer, more connected, more willing to do what is right, what is best, what is true, where we can say we no longer accept lies. You know, we no longer accept misinformation as news. Like we have an opportunity here to really rise up and I, I just, I hope that we do. Yeah. My memory of, uh, and I'm going to mess this quote up as well, but it doesn't really matter, of Winston Churchill, who when asked during uh, the World War II um, to cut funding for the arts, for the war effort, and uh, he refused to do it. And uh, he was asked why, and he said, well, then if we do that, what on earth are we fighting for? And um, mm. I know I paraphrased that, but the whole point is that, what on earth are we fighting for? What are we, what are we expecting to do? What, what is our society? And, and ask any lawmaker who wants to cut funding to the arts, ask them what they're doing at home when they're not working, what they do at home. Are they listening to music? Are they watching television? Are they reading books? Are they watching their six-year-old do a little dance in the living room? And the answer is yes, 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 yes. And if that isn't the most profound uh, reason to support the arts, I don't know of another. The idea that it fills our, our waking moments with a reminder of what it is to be a human being. So I started to do a lot more classical musicals, um, especially now in my professional career. And since then, a lot of girls, younger girls who look like me have reached out saying, thank you. Just thank you for being you. Thank you for being present. Thank you for doing this material because you're continuing to open the door for all of these different stories to be told by different people. Um, And that's what got me is just seeing like the impact that someone has seeing me on stage singing Camelot for instance, I've done Guinevere a couple times and uh, it broadens people's perspectives. And that's, that's kind of my mission. <laughs> it's just to say, hey, there are wow. some iconic stories, especially when they're not race specific. That's my kind of one rule. That if it's not about race, it's open to everybody. And I, you know, everyone's story deserves to be told. There are so many different flavors of people out there. And I think everybody should have a shot at telling different stories. Will you tell us a little bit about your coming out? Oh, sure. Um, Yeah, it wasn't easy. Feeling like it was, um, you know, I was going to be a big disappointment. Uh, I was going to sort of ruin all of the dreams that everybody in my family had for me. And so I was so certain uh, in Northern Michigan that once I came out, I would, I would lose it all. I'd lose everything, my family, my friends. Uh, I just ran away. Um, I kind of bounced around on some friends' couches and slept in my car a while uh, until my, my family actually invited me to come home. They did not want me um, bouncing around and they wanted to know that I was safe. And I'm very, very lucky and fortunate I got to go home. Um, and uh, my parents didn't know anything. They didn't know what it meant to be gay. They didn't really know how to support me. But what they told me was that they loved me. Um, and, and they were scared for me because they knew it would not be easy. And I think so many parents are terrified that it, it won't be easy for their kid. But the most important thing in that moment was that my parents told me they loved me. Um, and we figured it out together. You know, no two gay people are alike. And there's no right way to come out, wrong way to come out. Um, you know, and you don't owe anybody anything. I think that was the thing I, I learned most along the way is so many teenagers asking like, how do I do this? Like, what do I even do? Like, you know, uh, feeling like they owed the world and everybody around them something, uh, because they had recognized that they were, they were different than, than their, their straight peers. 
I really enjoyed that part of campaigning. I, I enjoyed being able to share those vulnerabilities and talk about that because I remember when I was 17 and looking up to Washington and looking up to people in positions of power, wondering if they actually cared about me, never feeling like they did and wishing that somebody would have talked about, you know, gay America or, or gay Americans as um, something that was okay and loved and accepted and cherished and embraced. So uh, I think it's important that we all, you know, fill those roles uh, if we can, which is why, you know, I'm, I'm glad to support you as well, because you're out there doing the same thing. 